Is baptism with water the washing away of sin itself? No. Only the blood of Christ and the renewal of the Holy Spirit can cleanse us from sin. For centuries, there have been a lot of debates about the various sacraments. In the case of holy baptism, there's been a great deal of misunderstanding and misperception about precisely what's going on when a Christian is baptized, when the water is placed atop their head, when the name of the triune God is said. Uh, What is going on? Oftentimes, Christians are tempted to veer into the realm of not just the mystical, but the magical, believing that somehow this rite possesses intrinsic power. At other times, Christians go terribly naturalistic or rationalistic, supposing this to be nothing more than a rather arbitrary sort of illustration, uh, a random, possibly dispensable way in which God's love and God's grace is illustrated or exemplified. Neither of these is true. In the time of the Reformation and in centuries since, theologians have had to distinguish between what's done by Jesus Christ and what is done by a minister, a pastor in his name. Jesus saves. Ministers don't save. Ministers do have the remarkable calling of administering or presenting the grace of Christ to others, of participating in his mission. But let's not be fooled. It is not a a pastor or a priest, a minister or an elder who somehow saves It's not water that saves in and of itself. It's rather, as the Catechism says, the blood of Christ and the renewal of the Holy Spirit. That spirit that unites us and yokes us, identifies us to Jesus Christ by faith. Baptism is the sign and the seal of this. It's a sign. It points like a parable or an illustration to this glorious gospel truth. It's a way in which God's gracious engagement of us is demonstrated, that God doesn't wait for us to get right, but God comes and cleanses us. Not only that, it's a sign that our cleansing involves some radical action. Baptism symbolizes death. It's the image of one being plunged underneath the waters and then yanked back out to life. Most of us, if we encounter baptism in the form of baptizing or sprinkling a baby, probably don't get this imagery in all its brutal and even violent uh, nature. But that's what it is. In the Old Testament, the waters symbolize death. And here, a person is being plunged beneath them and yanked back out of them. It's a symbol that we really do have to die to self. We really do have to die to our hopes, our dreams, our aspirations, our successes or our failures defining our future. And we really do have to be yanked out of that death, to be yanked out of that self-incurred brutality, that self-ridden guilt. We have to be yanked out of being curved in on ourselves, as Augustine and Martin Luther would say, and yanked back to being defined by Jesus' success, Jesus' perfection and the lack of any failure in his life. Baptism symbolizes this. And that's why we call it a sign. But baptism is also a seal. It's not arbitrary. It's not a random illustration which might be substituted by another. It's a God-ordained sacrament whereby this actually occurs. God really does grace us as we're baptized. It's not because water has somehow certain atomic properties, right? chemical properties that somehow make us better. It's not because the minister is holy and somehow by osmosis dispenses a bit of spirituality to us. It's not because of social reasons that somehow we're now being included into a holy fraternity. It's rather divine action that in the act of baptism, God now identifies us with Jesus Christ, that this is a seal of our union with him, our identity in his death, his resurrection. That's a remarkable statement. It's parallel to some other experiences in life, one of which would be a marriage ceremony. Of course, signing a sheet of paper, walking down an aisle, putting on a ring, in and of these themselves, these don't really mean that one is now one flesh with another. 
And yet they really do not simply symbolize, but actually seal that reality. We know when there's a wedding and a certificate of marriage is signed. We know when there's a ceremony and a bride walks down an aisle. We know when there's a liturgical celebration and rings and vows are exchanged. That This doesn't just illustrate something that's already true, but it actually makes it true. And when that pastor actually says, I now pronounce you man and wife, something becomes. It's not just a sign, though it is that, it's also a seal. It actually brings it to pass or makes it be. That's the kind of thing going on in the gospel. When Jesus Christ says, I absolve you of your sins. When in baptism he says, My death is yours. My resurrection is yours. When at the table of the Lord's Supper, he says, My body is for you. Take and eat. My blood is shed for you. Drink in remembrance of me. In these actions, he doesn't just illustrate truth, but he makes it be. Grace actually comes down. And that's why we speak of these as means of grace. They're not simply parables of grace. They're not simply illustrations of grace. They are real means of grace that God promises to work through them, that God pledges to be present in them, that God comes and brings life as we experience them. That's what it means for baptism to be used by Christ, even though it's not identified with or confused with Christ. It is Christ who saves. It is Christ who's glorious. It is Christ who is the giver of all grace. But it's the same Christ who's told us that he will be present in our baptism. It's the same Christ who's told us and commanded us to go out and to baptize. It is because we are Christ-centered that we turn so insistently to baptism. Thus, baptism doesn't lead us away or downplay the grace of Christ. It honors it by depending upon the particular shape, the particular means that Christ decides to employ in giving grace, that he promises to give us a sign and a seal of his new life through this particular sacrament. That's why we turn in faith to the practice of Christian baptism.